Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, Chapters 1 and 2. Um, we read Chapters 1 and 2, and, you know, I hope to hit on some significant themes that you should have picked up as you read. The first is the dehumanization of slaves that Frederick Douglass points out. And he starts this in the very beginning of chapter one by talking about how they didn't even know their birthdays. And he said they were almost like the horses of their slave masters, where they didn't even know how old they were, when their birthday was. Um, and that really creates this lack of identity, this um, lack of uh, value as a human being. And so that's really the first instance of dehumanization. And if you kind of look at the words, I hope you pick up on some things like um, he says in even the very first paragraph in the uh, third sentence says, little slaves know as little of their ages as horses. Um, they were ignorant. They were deprived. And, you know, even knowing your age was a privilege, he says. It was improper, impertinent to ask these types of questions. And I hope you see that, that dehumanization, and it continues with his relationship with his mother, Harriet Bailey. And so that should be the first person you include in your, in your active reading guide, how he wasn't even able to see her. He only saw her about five or six times in his whole life until she passed away. And when she passed away, no, no emotion. He felt like it was a stranger who had died. And um, slave masters did that intentionally so that there wouldn't be that connection between slave and his mother. Um, and so that continues that theme of uh, dehumanization. Uh, and then the other uh, significant um, theme is the use of scripture, the use of Bible and religion to perpetuate slavery. Um, and so uh, you see another example of his, uh, yeah, it's in this paragraph up here, um, right, where they were considered descendants of Ham. And so because of that, God had cursed Ham through Noah. And so slave owners would use that as an example to say, black people, those from Africa are considered slaves. But the irony behind that is that slave owners would have children with their slaves. And as the, the races mixed, you'd have children who are both of cursed people in, in their African descent, but also of white lineage. And so that really posed the problem, um, as Frederick Douglass pointed out. And then we get to the brutality of slavery, another, ex another extremely important uh, theme that is delved into here. And as I said before, you know, Frederick Douglass talks about such violent and shocking scenes because people, especially in the North, didn't understand what type of horrific events were occurring in the slaves' lives at this time. And so he, he, uh, gives this example of his aunt Hester, who was caught, you know, sneaking out and visiting a man named Ned and Mr. Plummer, remember that name. Remember all the names of the overseers. Uh, Mr. Plummer was the overseer. He had whipped aunt Hester until she was a bloody mess. She was screaming. She was in agony. She was in pain and, um, calling, and he was calling her these horrible names. And this was Frederick Douglass's first instance of this type of brutality, this type of um, violence in slavery. And he was but a child when he saw this. And so then we get into chapter two, where he talks a little bit more about his experience as a slave under Colonel Lloyd. And Colonel Lloyd was a very, very rich slave owner, had 300 to 400 slaves. And interestingly, people, uh, the slaves considered it a privilege to be working on his farm. And we'll talk a little bit about that irony uh, in just one second here, where we'll talk about um, the living conditions 
like this paragraph right here, here too the slaves of all the other farms receive their monthly allowance of food and their yearly clothing. And so if you kind of look at how much food they're giving a month, they were given eight pounds of pork a month for their family uh, or fish and one bushel of cornmeal. And every year they only got two coarse linen shirts, one pair of linen trousers, one jacket, one pair of trousers. They, they basically got one set of clothing every year. And can you imagine, especially a child who's growing, um, and he, he talks about how the children were most likely naked at the time because they just didn't have enough. You know, they didn't have enough blankets to sleep at night. And so in the wintertime, it was cold, no beds. Um, they just had to sleep on the floor. And so to everyone who had romanticized slavery and thought that they were getting some kind of fair compensation for their work, you know, Frederick Douglass is dispelling that notion and showing how terrible their living conditions were. And then he brings up another overseer, like I said, remember the names of the overseers, Mr. Severe, who is named aptly, right? It says it right here in this in this paragraph, he was rightly named, he was a cruel man. He, uh, Frederick Douglass had seen him whip a woman, causing the blood to run half an hour at a time. And just so much cruelty, profane swear, um, just so much horribleness. And then we have a uh, rare occurrence of a kinder overseer named Mr. Hopkins. Um, and so you kind of have good and bad. But regardless, I mean, even Mr. Hopkins, he still whipped the slaves. But it seemed like he didn't take pleasure in it. And he was called a good overseer. So you can kind of see how terrible their living condition is, where even though they're still getting whipped, they consider someone a good overseer if they're not as cruel as their predecessor. And so that theme also continues in this paragraph here where he talks about Colonel Lloyd's house being the great farmhouse. And as he describes it, slaves found it a privilege to work at this great farmhouse and almost was like a badge of honor that they were working in this this uh, the great farmhouse which is so ironic because they were trying to find joy and honor even though they were being slaves and so it really speaks to their lot in life and just how you know accustomed they had become to living this life and it was almost like there was there was no end in sight it was just what uh, they were bound to become and a lot of it has to do with their lack of education, which will become another theme in the following chapters. And then he talks about this other theme of music and the significance and importance of music in these slaves' lives. And they always had a tune. They were always singing as they were moving to plantation to plantation, as they were working. And typically, you know, music is associated with, with happiness, with mirth, and even the tones that they were using were very happy and melodic. But he regards these songs with so much sorrow. And um, if you look at this paragraph here, it just talks about he found himself in tears right here in the middle of this paragraph while hearing them. He, he understood just how dehumanizing slavery was and this the music that they were singing was yet another reminder of that and so even though people were listening to these music these songs and thinking that these slaves were happy they were they were miserable and um frederick Douglass ends this chapter chapter two by realizing that he just had this deep hatred for slavery and the songs that they sing were really ingrained in him to hate slavery and really kind of is the, the beginning point of his desire to join the abolitionist movement that will occur much later on in his life, but really the sowing the seeds to that. And so uh, these first two chapters really set up the tone of the life of a slave and just how terrible it was. And eventually Frederick Douglass's path to freedom and a desire to abolish slavery. So continue reading along, and I hope it, it really jars you to see what this part of our history was like.